tracking your progress is a really important one or shows up consistently within our data um, that the more that you're, you're you know, you're checking your progress. I lifted more. How much did I lift this week? How, what, how long did I work out for? Just showing that improvement, because if you work out, you will improve. The, 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 like, the growth in muscle mass will be slow, right? Unfortunately, physiological changes take some time. Like the, the mirror doesn't immediately change. The scale doesn't immediately change necessarily, depending on what your goal is. Um, but you do get stronger, but you just don't necessarily notice it. So being intentional in tracking progress is also a really good one. That was Troy Taylor, and you've landed on the Me and My Health Up podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Harcher, a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. The purpose of this podcast is to enhance and enlighten your well-being. And today we have Troy Taylor, who is an internationally renowned human performance leader. Troy was the high performance director at the US Ski and Snowboard. In that role, he led the world-renowned US Ski and Snowboard high performance team, supporting their athletes in winning more than 500 plus major international podiums between 2015 and 2021, and 15 medals, seven being gold medals, at the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic Winter Games. Over his career, Troy has worked with seven Olympic Games, supporting more than 500 Olympians and 50 Olympic medalists, presented at major international conferences around the globe, as well as mentored many Olympians to achieve high performance outcomes. And you've got Troy Taylor on the show today to share with you insights in terms of what he knows around human performance, exercise, remaining consistent and achieving your goals. So without much further ado, I'd love to welcome on the show, Troy Taylor. Welcome on the Me and My Health Up podcast. How are you, Troy? I'm doing awesome, Anthony, and yourself? Fantastic. So great to have you on the show and really looking forward to this conversation around health optimization, exercise and remaining consistent and then how we can tie in or leverage big data or AI to really help us propel our, I guess, our fitness forward. Um, so I uh, look forward to this conversation. But before we get underway, I'd love to hear how you have arrived at what you're doing today. Yeah, well, number one, thanks for having me on and two, looking forward to the conversation. My my journey is one of sort of, uh, I guess, two parts. I spent the first 20 years or so of my career uh, in elite sport. I did an undergraduate degree in sports science, a master's in exercise physiology. And when I was doing that master's degree, I got to volunteer for the British Olympic swim team uh, back for the, I want to say Athens Olympics, I date myself, uh, a while ago, volunteering actually with an Australian head coach, Bill Sweetman, who was the head coach at the time. And essentially that was my start. And over the next 15 or 20 years, I kind of spent uh, most of the time crisscrossing the globe, I worked for the British Olympic team, the Canadian Olympic team and the US Olympic team as a sports scientist, as a physiologist, as a strength and conditioning coach, and later as a high performance director, so running Olympic teams. And so from 2015 to 2021, I was the high performance director of US Ski and Snowboard, the Olympic team there. And a lot of that role is about seeking new innovations. Like there's a quite a large support team. It's a, it's a big NGB or national governing body. And a lot of that role is, is forward thinking. And so I was in the US. I don't have a ton of government funding necessarily. And so my innovation inspiration came from Silicon Valley. It came from startup world. And so I started forming these relationships with early stage startups around we did projects in brain stimulation, trans, brain, transcranial direct current brain stimulation, uh, projects in virtual reality. We filmed the 2018 Olympic course in full 360 video, but just basically immersing myself in the startup world. And I got the bug. I absolutely loved the startup world. And then in 2021, in, well, actually in 2020, in the pandemic, we're getting a tonal for my Olympic training center. The training center closed down with lockdown. I ended up uh, giving that tonal, installing that tonal into uh, Michaela Schifrin, a very famous skier, arguably the best in the world ever, into her house. I got to try it shortly afterwards, loved the project, uh, loved the machine. And then the sort of the combination between, hey, this startup fitnessy world and kind of thing that I really enjoy and my expertise in performance, maybe there could be some synergies here. And about a year later in 2021, uh, I was asked to join the company to head up their performance innovation team. Wow, what a journey. It's uh, incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, an exciting roller coaster you've been on. And, uh, you know, you've really got a lot of insight in terms of 
elite performance and how to help those that are chasing big dreams, how to help them optimize their journey and get them uh, as fast as possible to what they're seeking to achieve. And uh, for the listeners, obviously, we probably don't have the elite Olympians listening today. However, we've got uh, listeners that are really keen on health optimization and improving their fitness and and I mentioned before how important it is to stay consistent in order to stay on that journey. So based on your experience in this field of you know, elite optimization, what can you share with the listeners in terms of how to remain consistent with your training? Because there's no doubt that Olympians also have troubling periods through injuries, through just workload, that they're just sick and tired of keep doing the reps, right? Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. There's uh, Whether it's an elite athlete or I'm a 45 year old, like have aspirations to stay healthy, fit as long as I can uh, to do the activities I love to have, you know, see my kids grow up and their grandkids. And that's what our membership base is about. And that's actually one of the the reasons why I switched is you spend 20 years helping the best athletes in the world. And that's awesome. But really, you're making relatively small differences. You know, if I did with the 99th point ninth percentile before I ever started, I did anything. Hopefully I had an impact in my career, but you're you're talking the margins. Uh, Whereas uh, a product like Tonal or looking at more general consumer fitness, the opportunity is just so much larger to have a a much bigger impact in hundreds of thousands of millions of people, but also the magnitude of impact that you can have and really be life changing, whether it's in, you know, people who are type two diabetes or pre-diabetic or have cardiovascular disease or, uh, you know, struggle with sarcopenia or osteoporosis and the role of exercise within that. And so, how do you start? Well, it doesn't matter whether you're an Olympic athlete or or an everyday Joe, you have to stay consistent. Like no one out bout of exercise is going to be a magic pill, right? It's the repeated bout of doing it time and time again. And so mining some of our database uh, at Tonal, one of the things that I found really interesting was people that sign up to a program versus uh, just do one-off workouts are on average 12% more consistent. So just the act of joining a program, right? And that also link makes sense when you think about Olympic athletes. We we plan out quadrennials, what you're doing for four year cycles and then a one year macro cycle. You don't need to do that. But having the next four weeks, I'm working out, you know, with a reasonable uh, schedule, as opposed to I'm just turning up and kind of winging it as I go into the gym or into my home gym. Uh, But having a plan and having a program, 12% more consistent just by doing that. And this is association data. This is not necessarily causality, but certainly I think habits leaves, you know, clues. So signing up to a program, I would certainly say is, is one. I would say number two, looking at the data. People who have a narrow exercise window, if possible, in terms of the time to have a set schedule of when you work out is going to help you. If you're, you know, not everyone can do it all the time. We have work, we have commitments, we have family life. But if you have the luxury of saying, hey, I'm going to dedicate my workout is at this time. And for me, that's very much like I drop my kids off at school and I come and I work out. And if I don't get to that, like in my home gym, if I don't get into the gym by about, you know, 15 minutes after I get home from dropping the kids off, my workout day is somewhat done. Uh, I won't get into the habit. Things will come up. Email starts coming in. Um, So having a small exercise window, our data really says, and it doesn't matter whether it's morning or evening. It matters whether it's a small window. There is a slight bias towards morning being more consistent than evening. uh, And my my estimation or my guess on that data is more less things come up in the morning, right? If you're exercising, you you didn't have the bad day or the email from work that came and distracted you or the kids had a bad day. So uh, very much about sort of small exercise window. And then a couple of other things that I found interesting, some of our data was the, the role of social interaction, even in something like home fitness. Like, I think there's a lot around, you know, strong evidence base around accountability buddies and having someone to work out with. And I'm super supportive of that. But also just even uh, we find that members that on the app and follow another member, like they have, they follow their workouts, you know, give them a high five, that kind of thing, virtual kind of things. If you have between one and 10 friends, you're like 10% more, more consistent. And if you have like 10 or more friends, you suddenly got like about 20% more consistent on average. So that idea of interacting becomes really important. So follow a program with that. Give yourself a little flexibility. Like if it says three times a week, make it like, hey, I'm going to work out two to four times. 
If you do two, don't fall off the wagon, but have a program to set with and then give yourself a little flexibility within that program. Definitely do the the social uh, piece and then try to keep your workout window uh, relatively small if you have that luxury. Uh, those would be three tips to, to be more consistent. Another great tips. So I can see how they would uh, be relevant in terms of you're signing up, you're committing to something when you sign up to a program and then you allocate time, booked it in, it's, it's going to happen generally. And as you said, morning time's more likely because there's less things that are going to come in and disrupt us and take us off course. And then ha having that community, that tribe that we go along with on a journey, uh, sharing similar goals, I can see how that would all support us. Yeah, it's yeah. It, this is not rocket science. Like it's one of the things I like about our data is it's on 175,000 people training in the real world. So this is not like a training study in terms of, this is just what, these are the associations that come up. So it's nice to see those core core pieces come out you know, that we see in smaller, smaller, short 12, 16 week training studies, and you see it out over 52 weeks, over hundreds of thousands of people. One other one that I will say is tracking progress. Tracking your progress is a really important one or shows up consistently within our data that the more that you're, you're you know, you're checking your progress. I lifted more. How much did I lift this week? How, what, how long did I work out for? Just showing that improvement. Because if you work out, you will improve. The, 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 like, the growth in muscle mass will be slow, right? Unfortunately, physiological changes take some time. Like the, the mirror doesn't immediately change. The scale doesn't immediately change necessarily, depending on what your goal is. Um, but you do get stronger, but you just don't necessarily notice it. So being intentional in tracking progress is also a really- Yeah, it makes sense because, you know, seeing those changes in terms of body shape and things that that takes time and a bit you know focusing on more of those incremental gains going from workout to workout as you said you know are you lifting more or how you do you feel you know is it showing that you're pulling more forces or whatever newtons or whatever i don't know i'm not sure how you measure the resistance but in in terms of like that that really brings in data because if we know where well, we, we know what our goal is what we want to see is that we're tracking towards that goal so based on all your experience, you know, with human optimization or sports optimization and startups with data and AI, what, what can you share with the listeners in terms of what they should be tracking? I think a lot of it, like what we're really talking about here is sort of what elite athletes would call process goals. There's outcome goals and process goals. And like the outcome goal is winning an Olympic medal or setting a world record or doing whatever it might be. But like if you sure, purely fixate on that, you're, you're unlikely to ever reach it. It's such a big, far away kind of things. And so what are the process or the intermediary goals or, or data that I'm getting KPIs in that I would like that I'm moving towards? And so it's important that like, you know, if I was working with, say, an elite cross country skier versus a soccer player, they would have different KPIs. So, you know, I think what that refers back to is what are your goals and what are KPIs relevant to your goals? So I'm going to pick the, the ones that are most common for our membership. Number one, uh, the most common goal for our membership is just to build muscle mass. They're not looking to get on the bodybuilding stage, but they're, they're trying to build money, both muscle mass, mainly for the longevity effects, for the health benefits that come with muscle mass, not necessarily, you know, yes, I'm sure there's some aesthetic related goals in that I want to, I want to look good when I go to the swim pool with my kids, but it's not, I'm not competing on the stage or anything like that. And so if I'm thinking about muscle mass, some of the KPIs that I would be tracking would be something like on the tonal would track for you. But hey, how the number of hard sets am I doing a week? Like that would be a great metric per muscle group. So if I, there's a reasonable amount of evidence base that says, hey, starting almost real small if you're a beginner, but like one to four sets a week, you can start to get muscle mass gains. Uh, if you're working close to failure, you don't have to work to failure, but you do need to work hard, probably one to five reps from failure. So relatively hard, so hard sets, but that would be a great metric to track over time. And you want to increase it. And it's not, a, a, you know, an increasing forever, but you want to do a cycle where I gradually increase 10 or 20% per week up to a point, And then I might deload or take a little rest or increase the intensity a little bit. So I was lifting, I don't know, let's say 50 kilos for 10 repetitions. And I was doing five sets a week to start with. I increased that up to six or seven or eight. And then I might go back down to six and, de and increase the weight from 50 kilos to 60 kilos. It's kind of form of double progression. You kind of increase the, 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 the number of sets and then increase uh, the weight or resistance. So that might be a way that I would track for muscle mass. If I was thinking more about, um, I'm trying to think of what a might, might be, but like something like say, hey, I've got a goal of getting lean. 
I want to like lose some fat mass. That's another popular. We know that calories in more important, probably, or as important or more controllable than calories out. So exercise can have a useful tool in that, but it is not the only tool in, in things. You're not going to out exercise a bad diet, but you can diet and, you know, have worse or better or worse exercise regimes. So if your goal is into losing uh, fat mass, you want to make sure you're in a calorie deficit. You can do that purely by restricting the calories that you intake, or you can also by restricting the calories intake and increasing the calorie expenditure. And so work, you know, like force over distance is essentially how many calories you will burn. Um, and so something like Tonal would track that on a regular basis. We can know how much work or calories we have burnt within a given workout, and we can steadily increase that, or we can manipulate that more to the point to what our diet is, uh, and to make sure that we're in a calorie deficit. If you're not have something like Tonal that will automatically track for you, then you can think about like just like the amount of work you're doing in your session, the amount of total sets or volume that you're doing. If you're doing roughly the same workout, if you're doing more, you will be increasing your work. Obviously, if I'm doing bicep curls, doing 10 sets of that isn't the same expenditure of doing 10 sets of deadlifts per se. Um, so you want to have the similar there, but something like Tonal would track that metric for you and report it back to you, or you could kind of do it yourself. In terms of building that lean muscle mass, that first one you mentioned, and you know, measuring that via you know, the strength and the amount of uh, hard sets you are doing in terms of the nutrition around like supporting that growth around protein because you hear lots of different numbers around protein and what's the right amount of protein you know should i be ingesting in order to build that muscle mass what, what's your thinking on that yeah so number one caveat i'm not an, a registered dietitian or a nutritionist i do think i'm qualified to, to make this statement but i just want to want to clarify my scope i think the latest meta-analysis it's james morton's from a few years ago would say in order to optimize muscle mass development about 1.6 grams per kilo of body weight of protein to 2.2 grams per kilo of protein is I think what most people would say. And it's actually, if you look at the, if you go and look at the research paper, if you're really geeky, Morton, I'm going to mess up the year, but a couple of years ago. And if you look at the slope of the graph, there's an inflection point, but it's not great at 1.6. If you go to 1.2, you're probably not that bad. So I would say at least 1.2 ideally 1.6 grams per kilo, which works out to about 0.7 to 1 gram per pound of body mass is a really good uh, place to be, uh, which is, you know, if I'm what I'm, uh, I don't know, 80 kilos, 85 kilos. Uh, I'm like, you know, I'm eating 150 ish grams of protein a day, somewhere in that kind of region. So I think that's important. And it does, it seems more important protein requirement if we're calorie restricting. So if I'm in a calorie deficit, I probably need a little more protein than if I was in a calorie surplus. And so it seems like you know that plays a role in it. And it also age seems to play a role in it. And the older we get, we get a little less, a little more anabolic resistant. We need a little more protein to maintain, which is actually, if you look at like some of the, the dietary data, the opposite of what people do. They tend to eat less protein as they get older, not more. And in order to sustain muscle mass or maintain or grow muscle mass, we probably want to be on the upper end of that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilo. Uh, if we're either in a calorie deficit or we're old, or if we're both, then definitely on the upper end. And I would say if you're, you know, have a really high body mass, maybe you're obese, um, you know, BMI plus 35 plus and a large amount of fat mass, then you might be better looking at like a fat free mass calculation, which I won't give now, but more about like not just your total mass, but just your, your muscle mass to sustain that because it gets a bit out of whack sometimes if someone say 200 kilos or something it's it's not it doesn't scale perfectly but that would be my recommendation and it doesn't matter if it's diet uh, diet you know uh, meat protein or veggie plant-based protein i think the evidence says yeah. as long as you get the total protein across a wide range of uh food sources you'll be in a good spot and in terms of whether you like your goal is say toning versus weight loss is on, on the toning side of things is training faster good or should they you know have some nourishment before they train i mean like when you look at the weight loss side of things it sort of makes sense that yeah you know, the more they train faster or you know the more as you said they're taking less calories in and, and and working out more and hence got that calorie deficit so what about the toning if you're building muscle mass around fasting and training faster yeah the the research evidence as i read it on fasting 
is very much my, my take on that is it's individual preference. There's very actual little data to suggest that when you exercise, if we take about more aerobic exercise, because I think that's more people are doing fasted, you burn more fat during the immediate bout of fasted cardio. You do a 60 minute steady state zone two kind of effort. You burn more fat in that hour of working out if you had fasted than if you didn't fast. You burn more fat. But actually, if you look at it over 24 hour fat oxidation, actually levels out. The body's really smart. So it, you don't you don't actually expend any more fat or burn any more fat totally. You just burn more fat in the workout. And then over the next 24 hours, essentially, if you, you, you're fasted cardio, you burn a little less fat for the next, you know, 23 hours that you weren't working out. And if you were fed, you burn a little more fat. And so they come out to pretty much neutral in virtually every research study that I've ever seen on that space. So I take that as if you like to do fasted cardio, go for it. There's definitely no harm in doing it, but there's certainly probably, or there's very unlikely to be a significant benefit for fat loss in total, because we care about like the net daily change. From a resistance training perspective, my take on the research is you want to, we used to be really focused about protein timing you said you had your anabolic window if uh, you were really into lifting about 10 15 years ago this like, i got to get my pre-workout shake my during workout shake and my post-workout shake um and and you know if i missed if i didn't eat 30 minutes before to 60 minutes after i might as well not train i think the research in the last three to five years has really shifted our our, our views on that in that it matters most about total daily protein intake. When you take it, it has much smaller of an effect in that if you're hitting that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilo over the day, you're probably 90 something percent covered with your basis. You want to make sure it's in at least two feeding windows, I think is what the research evidence would suggest. So you don't want to eat just one like massive steak for dinner and nothing else. And you got I got 100 grams of protein, but it was you know, all in one meal. Actually, even that says you can still oxidize. But probably the, the data says uh, around two feeding windows are optimal. So whether you do it fasted or not fasted, I don't think makes a huge difference to your muscle mass gains per se. But if I was thinking about like optimizing that, I personally, I don't think the research evidence strongly supports it, but I don't think there's enough uh, research really out there. I wouldn't I would be trying to eat within about a two hour window of training, either before or after or both. Um, I don't think it's like this 90 minute window where it's got to be perfect, but I would probably go in, you know, having some food uh, and some protein and some carbohydrate a little bit before and a little bit after, primarily to maximize my workout. So I get the best out of my workout. I can push myself hardest. I can do the most amount of work. And we know that most amount of work is if I'm doing more hard sets because I'm fed. I'm more likely to get the outcome. So it's not the feeding necessarily that makes the difference, but it's my ability to do the hard work, which I think feeding probably helps. Fantastic. Thanks for uh, covering both sides of things, whether you're chasing weight loss or, you know, trying to build uh, muscle mass. It's uh, and you know different goals so uh um, yeah or do, or do them both simultaneously the the idea of recomposition like recomping is the idea of putting on muscle mass while simultaneously losing fat mass was you know thought to be like almost impossible if you're not a complete newbie or you have large amounts of fat mass it definitely doesn't happen and actually uh, there's a really nice uh, research paper out by Chris Barakat who's out of Tampa uh, that actually shows that yes if you're a bodybuilder on stage uh, you're probably not, that's not the best strategy. And if you're, you know, an elite endurance runner or whatever it might be, like with you know tiny amounts of muscle mass, neither of those end spectrums are best recomping, but pretty much everyone in the middle can simultaneously lose fat and build muscle. Actually a lot, lot easier than we used to think. Uh, and it's a strategy that I personally do. I'm not into bulking and cutting stages or anymore in my, my training career. I'm trying to recomp, I'm trying to, you know, lose put on a couple of pounds of muscle and lose five to ten pounds of fat pretty much all the time uh that's my my perfect kind of strategy and so i go through phases but that recomping and for that it's like don't be on too big a calorie deficit like 500 calories max a day don't be bigger than that like resistance train at least uh sort of three times a week uh and you know do that close proximity that hard training is probably the stimulus as well eating adequate protein. Fantastic. No, thanks for that sharing. And I just wanted to uh, tap back into the mindset side of things. So obviously at the start, you mentioned that it's really helpful to have a goal and then to have measures or KPIs to track how you're going against that goal. And then 
there's that whole thing around tying into programs and uh, having a commitment, uh, which could be a commitment to a goal as well. And then that community. Outside of that, what's really important around the mindset? I, I kind of touched on it on the bit, but the idea of like cognitive re- flexibility in that you can, you don't have to be all or nothing. I think what most people tend to do is commit to a goal. I'm going to achieve this, hit really hard at it, fall off the wagon once, and then I'm done. Right. And it's like, and that cycle of basically, okay, well, next New Year's, I'm going to recommit. And like January 1 to like 15 is like perfect. Uh, And as soon as you make a mistake, you fall off the wagon. Um, And so that concept of cognitive flexibility is the idea that, hey, I'm going to be in this type of window. I can, you know, I want to work out three to four times a week. But if I only do two, that doesn't mean that I should, you know, I should completely fall off the wagon. Or it allows me the flexibility. I had a bit of a down week at work. My kids were off at camp. I got five workouts in this week. It gives you that flexibility to kind of go up and down and don't tie things so rigidly uh, with such rigidity uh, to a specific thing. I think that's huge because we're all going to suffer setbacks and how we deal with those setbacks psychologically, I think is is really important. Again, I'm not a psych, uh, like I'm not an RD, uh, but I think that's something that we will talk a, a lot around um, would be that flexibility. Uh, to do that. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest mindset thing I think that people can do just to stay consistent over the long term is a little more flexible in themselves. Uh, There's actually a research study. It was the behavior change for good. uh, Katie Milkman uh, that did. She's a a Wharton prof uh, in behavior change, but they they studied gym analysis and tested 52 different behavior change strategies. And I think the biggest or one of the top three, at least, uh, strategy was they gave people a micro incentive, nine cents, I think it was, it was tiny, tiny amount of money for returning to a workout after a missed one. It wasn't don't miss two in a row. That was their whole thing. And that was the most powerful strategy for keeping people engaged was this nine cents, might have been seven cents, but small amount of money for not missing two in the row. And I think it's that same kind of, kind of, I guess, uh, psychological kind of proposition that's playing. But this idea of, of, of a bit of flexibility, don't miss, don't, don't fall off the wagon completely if I make a mistake. Fantastic insight. I, I, I really like what you shared there because that all or nothing approach, it's, it's sort of the same thing with people jumping into program. Programs, they'll jump into the programs. I'll go full hog into the program and just immerse themselves and, or, you know, 100%. And, and then they finish the program and they think, oh, phew, you know, it's done now. It's done. And, and, and then they, you know, it, it gives them the licensing effect to then take months off and then, oh, shit, I better get back onto a program because I've put so much weight on. And what you've shared is really that seeing it more as a sustainable thing for a lifetime. You know, what can you sustain and keep going for a lifetime as opposed to, just jump on the bandwagon and jump off the bandwagon. And and then I like what you shared around that study around, you know, if you fall off the cart, just get back on. Uh, It's just, you know, like you, you missed a day. So what? Just get back on. Yeah. And- I, I think it's so relatable. Like I, I do it with training. I find when we're like with food, I'm like, oh, I f-, like, you know, I'm not a, a rigid dieter. I, I generally flexible dieter, which means I have a, a rough macro target and a rough calorie. But sometimes I'm like, oh, I woke up and I had like, you know, chocolate croissants. I'm like, did that ruin my day? Or, you know, do I, you know, ruin my day in terms of a meal? Or do I, do I, you know, I can get back on my diet or eating more normally anytime I like. Uh, but we have this sort of kind of all or nothing mentality of where we kind of kind of put things away. So I think that's super important um, uh, for, for people to realize. Yeah, because it's that, you know, I'm either good or bad. And then when they're bad, yeah. they beat themselves up and, and then they sabotage themselves more because to make them feel better, right? So it's the never ending sort of cycle. Whereas if, you know, it's neither good or bad, it's just I'm on this journey. And yeah, so what I've, you know, had a croissant, but uh, just get back on track and you know, just yeah. and not that there's anything wrong with a croissant. It's just it, it's not aligned to my my necessarily goals of recomping. It's not a whole lot of protein and and doesn't doesn't meet my calorie requirements. But there's nothing wrong with it. it it's not to be demonized in any way. Yeah, and that, it gets back to that labeling things as good or bad, and yeah, and then thinking oh you've you've done the wrong. You know you've been you, you're terrible. So uh, really appreciate the. Uh, insight Troy and I'd love to um, for you to share a little bit more about Tonal and how people can connect with Tonal if you know they're really stimulated by you know what you shared around you know signing up to a program having that community support being able to measure their progress through AI and all the smarts so uh, yeah please share yeah so Tonal is essentially it's 
the, the device on my wall behind me, but it, it's an entire gym with elements of personal training that kind of fits in your space. And so, yeah, you can do 250 or so movements. It creates uh, the resistance via electromagnetic motors, uh, so much like a Tesla versus a combustion engine, if you want to kind of think about that way, which means it can be small. It can generate a lot of resistance in a very small, compact space, has TV screens with coaches and interactions, can measure your form. Uh, there's programs, 300 programs, 5,000 workouts, and yeah, just, just bolts on your wall. So it's a pretty convenient kind of option. So as I say, hundreds of thousands of people that are now sort of training on this regular. And one of those advantages, uh, which is beneficial for the company, but allows us to be beneficial to the users is every time anyone lifts, you generate all that data off the back end. So about 50 hertz, 50 times a second. So we just passed 200 billion pounds lifted, 6 billion reps, people from 18 to 80 plus years old. Um, and so really learning about how people train in the wild, how we can help them be more consistent, the things that we've talked about. How do I build product features or my team uh, build product features that help us do this? How can we do push notifications or you know, learn your specific habits? You normally work out when you drop the kids off at school. This day you skipped it. Can I prompt you, you know, nudge you back into a way of doing it. So, so yeah, just a really, really awesome piece of training equipment to fit in your house if you so desire. Uh, you can learn more about it. Tonal.com is probably the, the best way to learn about it. There's also uh, an Instagram that shares lots of our member stories and things that they train. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Troy. And I'll include those links you mentioned into the show notes. And I just wanted to Give you a massive thanks for coming on today and sharing such insight around you know high performance training as well as around you know how to basically stay motivated and consistent and help people achieve their goals whether it be through gaining muscle mass or losing fat mass or as you said recompositioning doing a bit of both um so i really appreciate your sharing that insight so thank you dad thank you for having me on i really appreciate it are you welcome Podcast disclaimer. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare, or professional advice and are provided for general information purposes only. All care is taken in the preparation of the information in this podcast. Connected Wellness Proprietary Limited, operating under the brand Me and My Health Up, does not make any representations or give any warranties about its accuracy, reliability, completeness, or suitability for any particular purpose. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it are not to be used as a substitute for professional, medical, psychological, psychiatric, or any other mental health care or health care in general. Me and My Health Up recommends you seek the advice of a doctor or qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Inform your doctor of any changes that you made to your lifestyle and discuss these with your doctor. Do not disregard medical advice or delay visiting a medical professional because of something you hear in this podcast. This podcast has been carefully prepared on the basis of current information. Changes in circumstances after publication may affect the accuracy of this information. To the maximum extent permitted by the law, Me and My Health Up disclaims any such representations or warranties to the completeness, accuracy, merchantability, or fitness for purpose of this podcast and will not be liable for any expenses, losses, damages, incurred indirect or consequential damages or costs that may be incurred as a result of the information being inaccurate or incomplete in any way and for any reason. No part of this podcast can be reproduced, redistributed, published, copied, or duplicated in a form without prior permission of me and my health up.